small talk on thyroid education, particularly for patients. Uh, I am Dr. Shah, I am one of the endocrinologists. Uh, before we begin this 10 minutes video, I would like to introduce our team. Uh, Dr. Siddharth, would you want to start? Yeah, I am Dr. Siddharth Chakravarti. I am an endocrine surgeon. I deal with thyroids and parathyroid glands. Dr. N.J. Paul, Professor of Endocrine Surgery from CMC Bellow. I am Dr. Srinivas Panja. I am an endocrinologist in Houston, Texas, in USA. Dr. Neela Vedi, endocrinologist, Osmania Medical College. Dr. Brinda Alpura, I am an endocrinologist with Idea Clinics. Dr. Meher Prasad, I am a diabetes and so welcome everybody. I think we'll start with uh, understanding what is a thyroid gland. Who wants to take that question? Yeah, I, I can take it. So the thyroid is a tiny gland. It's shaped like a butterfly. It sits in front of the neck. And it makes a very important hormone. It's called the thyroid hormone. We call the thyroid the power machine of the body because it does regulate the functioning of every cell of the body. It's uh, one of the essential hormones for the for proper functioning of the body. So problems from the thyroid can happen if you don't make enough thyroid hormone, or if you make too much thyroid hormone. And it's very easy to identify it with single blood tests. Thank you. Uh, I think uh, going forward, the next question is, we know what thyroid gland is. So what are the common problems we come across when we uh, talk about thyroid? Madam, can you take that question? Yeah. So the common problems, thyroid problems are either hypofunction, there is a decreased hormone secretion from the gland or it's a more, more secretion, that is the hyperfunction in these states. So the hypohormonal state or low hormonal state is also known as the hypothyroidism normally and the hyperhormonal status is also known as the hyperthyroidism. These are all the functional disorders. So apart from this, there can be a nodule or any, any nodule or any, it can be a benign nodule or it can be a Apart from this, there are again uh, uh, like transient uh, uh, transient changes in the thyroid function, which we have to be like in a sense uh, a treating doctor or treating physician has to interpret it in a proper sense so that appropriate management can be issued. So basically, hypofunction status, hyperfunctioning status, apart from the benign and the malignant nodules. Thank you, ma'am. So basically, we have functionality problems and anatomical. Uh, structural problems. So coming to functionality, uh, Dr. Munda, you have a lot of experience in the West. Uh, can you take us through how do you manage a underactive thyroid and an overactive thyroid in general population? What happens to, what do patients present with and uh, what exactly are the implications of treatment? So, um, as ma'am talked about that there are two kinds of problems that can come with the functionality of thyroid gland. It is under functioning as we call it hypothyroidism or it is making too much thyroid hormone which is hyperthyroidism. So um, as Dr. Pancha said that it maintains the metabolism, it determines how your body cells are running. So when we talk about hypofunction, everything in the body kind of slows down. If you have to explain it to somebody, um, everything slows down. You may feel more tired, you may feel more cold. You may feel like you have a depressed mood, you don't feel like doing anything, um, you may complain of uh, constipation. So overall, there is, uh, the symptoms that we come across are more of a slowing down of the uh, body. Uh, in contrast, uh, um, with hyperfunctioning uh, thyroid gland, we come across with people who have extra amounts of energy. Um, people may complain of uh, lose frequent bowel motions, people may complain of having anxiety, feeling jittery, having tremors, they may complain that heart beat is a little bit faster. So um, fortunately, like Dr. Panja said, that it, is, I, it is easy to identify these uh, uh, hormonal issues with simple blood tests. Um, so uh, if you have an underactive or a hypofunctioning thyroid, then the treatment is essentially replacement of that thyroid hormone as a tablet from outside. And your doctor can help determine the doses in which uh, uh, we can make sure that thyroid hormone comes back to a normal range. Um, for hyperfunctioning uh, uh, thyroid glands, management can be broadly categorized as uh, surgical. So if uh, uh, some, in some cases we do offer surgery, 
uh, and I think uh, later we can talk about the surgical aspect of uh, thyroid surgery. But surgery is one option where you have a big enlarged gland, um, it is hyperfunctioning, we can offer it to some patients. Second is a radiation treatment, more commonly known as a radioactive iodine treatment. Um, again, we classify surgery and radiation as more like permanent methods of uh, 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 treating this hyperfunctioning gland. Um, more commonly that we see uh, day in day out is the use of medications. We call them as anti-thyroid drugs, anti-thyroid medications. They are essentially tablets uh, that can be used to decrease the activity of your thyroid gland and your doctor can best determine the use of uh, one of these modalities uh, uh, as a treatment option. option. Thank you. Thank you ma'am. So coming next, the one of the things that uh, this question I might ask uh, Dr. Meher Prasad. Dr. Meher Prasad uh, is an expert. He has a lot of exp experience from the UK and he is based out of Chennai. So Dr. Meher Prasad, when a patient walks in these days, patients have let us done routinely in their, uh, in their uh, workplace and you know. So when a patient walks to you with a thyroid blood report, what exactly determines uh, how far you should probably start treatment? So what, what I meant is patients come present these days with a abnormal result. The, so how do you handle situations like that? Yeah, I agree with you that uh, we are seeing more and more of uh, I mean, post after the hospital checkups and also the, uh, um, the company initiated checkups. We are seeing more and more uh, uh, abnormal results, uh, borderline results, patients working with them. Um, and first of all, uh, the uh, it depends on the uh, symptoms of the patient. If they have any symptoms, then we will uh, 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 probe in further. Uh, and then, uh, and, uh, the uh, uh, family history is also an important contributor. Um, and then, uh, depending upon the depending upon the age, then the cutoffs are also there. We have to, and uh, depending upon the age, the uh, the, uh, the country they are in, and also the area they are in. Thank you. So this brings to the next question. Uh, in India, we have a lot of patients with slight abnormality, which is borderline test. So there is a lot of anxiety in these patients because they refer to internet and understand and that. that uh, so the question now is, what should we do with subclinical results, the borderline TSH? Uh, madam, you want to uh, explore that? Yes. And the other worry is a uh, lot of variation between different labs. So, uh, uh, subclinical hypothyroidism, what do we mean by that? Like, we mean, in the sense, like, it's a biochemical uh, diagnosis. It's not a, a clinical diagnosis. It's like when the T3, T4 levels, which are the hormones coming from the thyroid gland are normal, but still there is a mild elevation of the TSH. So, uh, it is called subclinical hypothyroidism. So, the, the, like the meaning itself is subclinical. So, they may not have any symptoms which are attributable to the thyroid dysfunction or they may be having also. So, it is important in such a situation to know why the tests have been done. Is it routinely done or for any symptoms or does the, like, do the patient have any pointer or for any pregnant woman or infertility treatment or any menstrual disorders. So, I think background, uh, background setup for which the thyroid functions were evaluated. I think that needs to be known because it's very important and it's one of the determining factor for us to make a decision on should we go ahead with the treatment or should we restrain for a while again we check. And this is one of the important things. So generally subclinical hypothyroidism we will go for the treatment when a patient has goiter, when a, like underlying autoimmunity is being evident by checking the antibody status or if a woman is pregnant a woman who is pregnant or planning for pregnancy, planning for a pregnancy. So I think these are some of the causes, like some of the situations where we would like to go for the treatment. But otherwise, an uh, elderly woman coming with a TSH of mild elevation, we would not like, in the sense, we would not be in a hurry to because, so as uh, Dr. Mehan Prasad said, age also is one of the factors for different cutoffs. So as the age advances, there is a slight elevation in the slight, like normally also physiologically there is a higher side TSH. So these are all the factors which we need to take into consideration to make a decision on the treatment aspect. If you like, if the physician or the treating endocrinologist makes a decision to treat, so they will go for the treatment and 
breach of the status. So whether the appropriate dose has been given or not subsequently over a period of 2 to 3 months. If the decision not to treat is being taken by the endocrinologist or treating physician, so then again we have to follow them. So because whether there is a rising trend of the TSH is there. Initially it was somewhere around 6.57, something like that. So over a period of time is it going to rise? So I think that will give us a clue to again to make a, to reassess ourselves, to make a decision on this patient is going to require or not going to require. So this is one of the aspects. And as you said rightly, definitely uh, there is a lot of assay variability is there. Again, okay, that has to be checked. That's why subclinical hypothyroidism, it's a persistent elevation of the TSH, persisting for more than 12 weeks. So that's why a single value of TSH so should not be taken into account unless the, the background situation warrants that it should be treated. If the background situation does not warrant to treatment, so you can repeat after a period of 12 weeks, 10 to 12 weeks, then make a decision. Thank you. The, coming to this variability, one of the problems we face in India, Dr. Tanga, is uh, there is a lot of variation. People get lab tests done. Uh, within a week from different labs and there is a lot of variability in their thyroid function results. So what happens in the US? How credible are the results? What is the quality of the test done in the western world? So I think variability is still there in the US as well and definitely between labs there is you know variability in the range. There's few labs where the cutoff is as low as 3.5 so those people have a lot of those labs show up with a lot of hypothyroidism. So variability is there, but I think, as Professor said, I think the key to these numbers is symptoms. You know, subclinical is such a, a misleading name because it says subclinical, but really when we talk about treatment, you know, even if they have the numbers in the subclinical range, we treat only if they have symptoms, which is clinical. So I think uh, it's best to talk to your endocrinologist about it because they will be able to best determine with the unique medications because these medications are generally safe but these are some things you got to take them for the rest of your life. So before we commit somebody for a lifelong treatment, we got to make sure they actually need it. So absolutely if you have numbers which don't make sense, which are abnormal, you can see a specialist who can actually make the best assessment based on the symptoms, are they pregnant, any menstrual problems, if they're elderly, they have osteoporosis or thinning of the bones. So I think really for those borderline tests, it's best to see a specialist before you start taking a treatment for the rest of your life. Interesting. Now, let's spend a couple of minutes on thyroid and pregnancy. Why uh, thyroid becomes such an essential uh, condition in a woman who is pregnant or for that matter after the postpartum? Uh, Dr. Dunda would want to uh, expand on that. So, um, in very simple language, I like to explain it to my pregnant patients that uh, their thyroid has to do the work for two people. And uh, uh, a lot of times we see thyroid uh, disorders being uh, like uh, diagnosed during pregnancy because pregnancy sort of acts like a stress test. So, um, the reason why it is important is uh, for, uh, you know, baby's growth and uh, uh, development uh, We've seen like studies uh, relating cognition, cognitive abilities in women who were undertreated or not treated for hypothyroidism in later life. Um, so uh, I think the thyroid hormone is very, very important uh, uh, initially for conception and then later on for fetal growth and development. Um, uh, that's why it's a part of an antenatal workup or like uh, your doctor is going to check for the thyroid hormone at your first visit to your obstetrician. Um, and uh, adequate replacement is important. We have uh, different uh, cutoffs for uh, TSH uh, for pregnancy, uh, divided into diff three different trimesters. Um, post uh, delivery, also, we have something called as postpartum thyroiditis. So, suppose even if you did not have any thyroid related issue during the pregnancy, there is an entity called postpartum thyroiditis, and it is essential that uh, we check. Um, if you were treated for uh, thyroid disorders during pregnancy, then we usually recommend testing six weeks uh, post-delivery uh, to determine the ongoing need for uh, thyroid hormone replacement. Uh, but uh, checking for postpartum thyroiditis is, is more like a clinical judgment, essentially, if uh, 
if a patient presents to us with certain symptoms, uh, that may be concerning for a thyroiditis like nature, but we do check the thyroid. Thank you. Uh, the next question is for Dr. Meher Prasad. Uh, as an expert on obesity and weight management, how much of thyroid is a contributor to weight gain? One of the things that people with uh, uh, obese, uh, with high BMIs, they attribute all their weight to their uh, mild thyroid disorders. So, my question to you is, how much of the thyroid is a contributor to obesity uh, as opposed to vice versa? Yeah, um, uh, you mentioned that's, uh, that's quite a uh, common excuse that people uh, use for uh, obesity. Well, certainly, uh, uh, underactive thyroid contributes, if, it uh, if it's really underactive, it does contribute to their efforts in uh, reducing weight. So, um, and, uh, hindering, in fact, hindering the effects in, uh, in reducing weight. So, there is, uh, when, if it is abnormal, certainly it has to be treated before, uh, the, uh, before the obesity management is attempted. Um, maybe a 5 or 10 percent may will be contributing towards the uh, uh, obesity indirectly. Uh, indirectly, um, in the, so that's that's one thing. And so, uh, certainly in screening for people with uh, obesity, thyroid function test is essential because that way it makes their efforts uh, even more fruitful and, uh, and uh, their motivation keeps them more motivated. At the same time, if they find out that the thyroid is normal, again their motivation can we can motivate them and then direct them in the right uh, sense. Right. And so that way it is important and they, they, they does uh, have a uh, contribution but not that to that extent. I think now that we talked about the functionality, let's explore next few minutes on the uh, thyroid lumps. We have some of the best uh, thyroid surgeons from South. Uh, so uh, what I want to take through is a patient journey. So let's example, one of the things is Thyroid lungs. How common is thyroid lungs in our society? How do you want to take it out? Um, I, I think uh, thyroid nodules are very common, nodules as we call them. Um, uh, especially as we grow older, so aging population and women tend to have uh, uh, a lot of, uh, like have an increasing frequency of these nodules. And certain populations, of course, uh, you know, demographics uh, can change numbers but in certain populations up to 50% of the population may have these thyroid nodules. Fortunately 90% uh, of them are benign or uh, not concerning or non cancerous uh, but uh, it is the risk for uh, malignancy or cancer, having a cancer or a tumor in the rest 5-10% to 10 that we need to stress on the fact that these certain nodules may need evaluation. So, um, Thyroid nodules are common and uh, in a selected few patients we do need to uh, explore further whether these nodules need to be further investigated or not. And uh, thyroid ultrasound is the preferred modality of imaging for these nodules. So when, when a patient notices or the relatives notice a nodule uh, or a lump in their thyroid, so they don't know where to go for help. So one of the things they might go is to the local doctor. Uh, the question is when they come to us and the local, the general physician refers to the specialist doctors. Uh, so as a specialist doctor, madam, uh, when a patient walks to you with, uh, with that lump in the neck and uh, uh, one of the biggest anxieties is they may not disclose but the worry they have in their mind is thyroid cancer. So when a patient with a thyroid lump Walks to you. What are the processes you follow through, and what what happens to your patient? So, like as you rightly said, like uh, uh, observing or noticing a lump is a concern. But especially, uh, like it's more common in the room. So, uh, definitely, it's a concern for them. And uh, as they come to us, first thing we would like to examine properly, like say as as you said, like, there's a concern, and uh, as Dr. Brinda said, okay, most of them are benign, but still. We do not know this patient is going to have a malignancy or non cancer disease. So that's important by making a clinical decision. So we have to examine properly, look for any, any clues we get from the clinical examination. So is yes, this nodule is a non cancerous one or a cancerous one?
sometimes it may be deceiving that clinically we may not get any clue regarding the underlying cancerous condition. So in such a situation, so we do first functional evaluation we have to do. So doing a TSH, a simple TSH. So depending on that, further plan of action will be done. So if a TSH is normal or it can be elevated like a suggestive of underactive thyroid or it can be suppressed like suggestive of like overactive thyroid. So de de depending on this, if it's a uterine, the TSH is normal, uh, a woman with a lung with the TSH is normal, then we have to subject her. Like, as Vinda said, like it is the ultrasound. So ultrasonography, which is a simple non-invasive technique where we would like to look at some of the features which may give again a clue regarding the non-cancerous or cancerous situation. So and further, suppose most of the time ultrasonography if it's properly done will give us a lot of clue regarding the cancerous or non-cancerous situation. So depending on that, we will again subject the patient any suspicious lesion on the ultrasound will be subjected for the cytology. So that what we call is the FNAC or fine needle aspiration cytology where a uh, small needle will be put like which is an ultrasound guide looking at the ultrasound so where the depth and the proper suspicious lesion we have to put a needle into that lung so that a small material will be aspirated and looked under the microscope to look for any, any features of either non-cancerous or cancerous features are there. Then subject, sub, depending on that subject report, like either it's a non-cancerous or cancerous, if it's a cancerous, definitely we have to hand over to the surgeon for the surgery. And underactive thyroid has to be treated because small lumps can be there associated with the hypothyroid dose. So where it has to be treated, treated with the levothyroxine or if it's a overactive, case which is low, so then it has to be subjected to the technician scintigraphy where it's a radio nuclear image. So which will give us the clue because there can be a transient states of uh, TSH suppression which will recover automatically over a period of time. So or it can be a truly overactive gland which requires some treatment. So I think these are all the first initial is the so uh, uh, lung with clinical clues of malignancy like again in such a case also we have to go for a functional evaluation doing a simple TSH followed by the ultrasound imaging and followed by the cytology then depending on that you have to hand over to the surgeon Thank if it's proven to be a malignancy or suspicious to be also Thank you So in the US uh, Dr. Pavel the issue is one of the things we have here is the reporting of the uh, fine needle aspiration cytology report uh, the, the worry we have is indeterminate sample, inadequate sample or you know different reports come through to us. How uh, as a thyroid specialist within the western world, how is this addressed? Yeah, so, so I think the indeterminate nodules are still the most frustrating report that we get. So at least these days we have some molecular analysis that can be done on the samples and that gives us a little bit more information for those individual nodules, what is the risk of malignancy and they kind of classify the risk of either low risk or greater than 50% risk and sometimes greater than 90% risk. So depending on those, uh, we actually, the higher risk, we still send in for surgery. Sometimes if I have a report which is indeterminate, but on the ultrasound I see a lot of features which are concerning, uh, like the calcification or central vascularity, I still don't necessarily wait for a molecular analysis. I send them to my surgical colleagues and say, you know what, this looks very suspicious. Maybe do a hemithyroidectomy and do a frozen biopsy and depending on that work. Uh, so yes, I think clinical judgment, but yes, we do at least in the US have those molecular analysis. We do have those genetic testing for the you know mutations in terms of the malignancies available right now. It gives us a little bit more information to see if they need to have surgery. Interesting. The molecular analytics, how useful are they in the Indian context? Is it something we should be exploring? So, I think it is it, it, it's important in terms of if it is available in some of the very easily, I think it is worth doing it because it might save So, it is, if it is available easily, it's definitely worth doing. Um, if it is not, then you still have to depend on some adjustment. Uh, Prof, uh, uh, coming to you, sir, the issue is when it is a benign nodule, 
be reassured or that uh, whatever action needs to be taken will be done. The problem comes is when they come out with a malignancy. How uh, uh, malignant is this malignancy? Thyroid malignancy in the context of prognosis, how do you rate this condition? Yes, uh, generally thyroid for cancer fortunately is largely very curable with good outcomes. So that's one reassurance and we have a sort of rule of thumb victim saying that if you are cursed to have a cancer, choose thyroid papillary because it's so good in outcome, virtually normal life expectancy, especially in young people. So it's reassuring that way. But there are a few uh, minority, there are about 5 to 10 percent of cancers that can behave aggressively and we need to actually look at this and it's sometimes difficult at the first presentation to actually predict how this is going to behave. So we have a way of uh, doing a repeat assessment in about two years time when we see the response to the initial therapy and then we will know better how this is going to behave in the long term. But the reassurance is the majority of thyroid cancers are very durable and you can have a normal life after the treatment. Thank you. Uh, Siddharth, you were the backbone behind this one-stop concept. As you can see, the patient journey goes through from a primary physician to various doctors, uh, multiple places for scans, FNACs. As a specialist in thyroid, uh, with a passion in uh, supporting patients, how do you see the role of one-stop service for thyroid? Yeah. Why do you think there is a role for that? Stop service we are actually launching this basically to make it simple for the patient. It's a center where you come and uh, you can have a consultation with an endocrinologist. Need be if you need the if you have a nodule or what we call the thyroid nodule clinic. If you have a nodule, uh, if you need an uh, FNAC or a needle test or an ultrasound, that also will assess it. And this just can be done at the same place. And also, a lot of the times when we do a needle test, uh, I mean, we do the needle test, ask the patient to come after two days, and they find that uh, the sample is not <coughs> enough or it's not adequate, and then we have to repeat it. So here we are planning to have uh, on-site pathology, who is a specialist in looking after the cells cytology. So they will say immediately whether your specimen is adequate or not, and the report will also be give, given on the same day. So. It's like consultation, investigations, ultrasound, FNAC if required. Everything will be done on the same day and you will get an expert opinion from the endocrinologists and also the specialist surgeons.